Book 8, Chapter 10 of War and Peace, Volume 2, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book 8, Chapter 10 During the entr'acte, a whiff of cold air came into Elaine's box, the door opened, and Anatole entered, stooping and trying not to brush against anyone. "'Let me introduce my brother to you,' said Elaine, her eyes shifting uneasily from Natasha to Anatole. Natasha turned her pretty little head toward the elegant young officer and smiled at him over her bare shoulder. Anatole, who was as handsome at close quarters as at a distance, sat down beside her and told her he had long wished to have this happiness, ever since the Narishkin's ball, in fact, at which he had had the well-remembered pleasure of seeing her. Karagin was much more sensible and simple with women than among men. He talked boldly and naturally, and Natasha was strangely and agreeably struck by the fact that there was nothing formidable in this man about whom there was so much talk, but that, on the contrary, his smile was most naive, cheerful, and good-natured. Karagin asked her opinion of the performance, and told her how at a previous performance Semenova had fallen down on the stage. "'And do you know, Countess,' he said, suddenly addressing her as an old, familiar acquaintance, "'we are getting up a costume tournament. You ought to take part in it. It will be great fun. We shall all meet at the Karagans. Please come. No? Really, eh?' said he. While saying this, he never removed his smiling eyes from her face, her neck, and her bare arms. Natasha knew for certain that he was enraptured by her. This pleased her, yet his presence made her feel constrained and oppressed. When she was not looking at him, she felt that he was looking at her shoulders, and she involuntarily caught his eye so that he should look into hers rather than this. But looking into his eyes, she was frightened, realizing that there was not that barrier of modesty she had always felt between herself and other men. She did not know how it was that within five minutes she had come to feel herself terribly near to this man. When she turned away, she feared he might seize her from behind by her bare arm and kiss her on the neck. They spoke of most ordinary things, yet she felt that they were closer to one another than she had ever been to any man. Natasha kept turning to Elaine and to her father, as if asking what it all meant. But Elaine was engaged in conversation with the general and did not answer her look, and her father's eyes said nothing but what they always said, "'Having a good time? Well, I'm glad of it.' During one of these moments of awkward silence, when Anatole's prominent eyes were gazing calmly and fixedly at her, Natasha, to break the silence, asked him how he liked Moscow. She asked the question and blushed. She felt all the time that by talking to him she was doing something improper. Anatole smiled as though to encourage her. First, I did not like it much, because what makes a town pleasant, ce sont je jolies femmes, are the pretty women. Isn't that so? But now I like it very much indeed, he said, looking at her significantly. You'll come to the costume tournament, Countess. Do come and putting out his hand to her bouquet and dropping his voice, he added, "'You will be the prettiest there. Do come, dear Countess, and give me this flower as a pledge.' Natasha did not understand what he was saying any more than he did himself, but she felt that his incomprehensible words had an improper intention. She did not know what to say, and turned away, as if she had not heard his remark." But as soon as she had turned away, she felt that he was there, behind, so close behind her. "'How is he now? Confused? Angry? Ought I to put it right?' she asked herself, and she could not refrain from turning round. She looked straight into his eyes, and his nearness, self-assurance, and the good-natured tenderness of his smile vanquished her. She smiled just as he was doing, gazing straight into his eyes and again she felt with horror that no barrier lay between him and her. The curtain rose again. Anatole left the box, serene and gay. Natasha went back to her father in the other box, now quite submissive to the world she found herself in. 
All that was going on before her now seemed quite natural, but on the other hand, all her previous thoughts of her betrothed, of Princess Mary, or of life in the country, did not once recur to her mind, and were as if belonging to a remote past. In the fourth act there was some sort of devil who sang waving his arms about, till the boards were withdrawn from under him and he disappeared down below. That was the only part of the fourth act that Natasha saw. She felt agitated and tormented, and the cause of this was Karagin, whom she could not help watching. As they were leaving the theatre, Anatole came up to them, called their carriage, and helped them in. As he was putting Natasha in, he pressed her arm above the elbow. Agitated and flushed, she turned round. He was looking at her with glittering eyes, smiling tenderly. Only after she had reached home was Natasha able clearly to think over what had happened to her, and suddenly remembering Prince Andrew, she was horrified, and at tea, to which all had sat down after the opera, she gave a loud exclamation, flushed, and ran out of the room. "'Oh, God! I am lost!' she said to herself. "'How could I let him?' She sat for a long time, hiding her flushed face in her hands, trying to realize what had happened to her but was unable either to understand what had happened or what she felt. Everything seemed dark, obscure, and terrible. There, in that enormous illuminated theatre, where the bare-legged Dupour, in a tinsel-decorated jacket, jumped about to the music on wet boards, and young girls and old men and the nearly naked Elaine, with her proud, calm smile, rapturously cried, Bravo! There, in the presence of that Elaine, it had all seemed clear and simple. But now, alone by herself, it was incomprehensible. What is it? What was that terror I felt of him? What is this gnawing of conscience I am feeling now? she thought. Only to the old countess at night in bed could Natasha have told all she was feeling. She knew that Sonia, with her severe and simple views, would either not understand it at all or would be horrified at such a confession. So Natasha tried to solve what was torturing her by herself. "'Am I spoiled for Andrew's love or not?' she asked herself, and with soothing irony replied, "'What a fool I am to ask that! What did happen to me? Nothing! I have done nothing! I didn't lead him on at all!' Nobody will know, and I shall never see him again," she told herself. So it is plain that nothing has happened, and there is nothing to repent of, and Andrew can love me still. But why still? Oh, God, why isn't he here?" Natasha quieted herself for a moment, but again some instinct told her that though all this was true, and though nothing had happened, Yet the former purity of her love for Prince Andrew had perished. And again in imagination she went over her whole conversation with Karagin, and again saw the face, gestures, and tender smile of that bold, handsome man when he pressed her arm. End of Book 8 Chapter 10《Book Eight, Chapter Eleven, of War and Peace, Volume Two, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. — Book Eight, Chapter Eleven. Anatole Karagin was staying in Moscow because his father had sent him away from Petersburg, where he had been spending twenty thousand roubles a year in cash, besides running up debts for as much more which his creditors demanded from his father. His father announced to him that he would now pay half his debts for the last time, but only on condition that he was sent to Moscow as adjutant to the commander-in-chief, a post his father had procured for him, and would at last try to make a good match there. He indicated to him Princess Mary and Julie Karagina. Anatole consented and went to Moscow, where he put up at Pierre's house. Pierre received him unwillingly at first, but got used to him after a while, sometimes even accompanied him on his carousals, and gave him money under the guise of loans. As Shinshin had remarked, from the time of his arrival Anatole had turned the heads of the Moscow ladies, 
especially by the fact that he slighted them and plainly preferred the gypsy girls and French actresses, with the chief of whom, Mademoiselle Georges, he was said to be on intimate relations. He had never missed a carousal at Danilov's or other Moscow revelers, drank whole nights through, outvying everyone else, and was at all the balls and parties of the best society. There was talk of his intrigues with some of the ladies, and he flirted with a few of them at the balls. He did not run after the unmarried girls, especially the rich heiresses who were most of them plain. There was a special reason for this, as he had got married two years before, a fact known only to his most intimate friends. At that time, while with his regiment in Poland, a Polish landowner of small means had forced him to marry his daughter. Anatole had very soon abandoned his wife, and for a payment which he agreed to send to his father-in-law, had arranged to be free to pass himself off as a bachelor. Anatole was always content with his position, with himself and with others. He was instinctively and thoroughly convinced that it was impossible for him to live otherwise than as he did, and that he had never in his life done anything base. He was incapable of considering how his actions might affect others, or what the consequences of this or that action of his might be. He was convinced that, as a duck is so made that it must live in water, so God had made him such that he must spend thirty thousand roubles a year, and always occupy a prominent position in society. He believed this so firmly that others, looking at him, were persuaded of it too, and did not refuse him either a leading place in society or money, which he borrowed from any one and every one and evidently would not repay. He was not a gambler, at any rate he did not care about winning. He was not vain. He did not mind what people thought of him. Still less could he be accused of ambition. More than once he had vexed his father by spoiling his own career, and he laughed at distinctions of all kinds. He was not mean, and did not refuse anyone who asked of him. All he cared about was gaiety and women, and, as according to his ideas, there was nothing dishonorable in these tastes, and he was incapable of considering what the gratification of his tastes entailed for others. He honestly considered himself irreproachable, sincerely despised rogues and bad people, and with a tranquil conscience carried his head high. Rakes, those male Magdalenes, have a secret feeling of innocence similar to that which female Magdalenes have, based on the same hope of forgiveness. All will be forgiven her, for she loved much, and all will be forgiven him, for he enjoyed much. Dolikov, who had reappeared that year in Moscow after his exile and his Persian adventures, was leading a life of luxury, gambling, and dissipation associated with his old Petersburg comrade Karagin and made use of him for his own ends. Anatole was sincerely fond of Dolikov for his cleverness and audacity. Dolikov, who needed Anatole Karagin's name, position, and connections as a bait to draw rich young men into his gambling set, made use of him and amused himself at his expense without letting the other feel it. Apart from the advantage he derived from Anatole, the very process of dominating another's will was in itself a pleasure, a habit, and a necessity to Dolikov. Natasha had made a strong impression on Karagin. At supper after the opera, he described to Dolikov, with the air of a connoisseur, the attractions of her arms, shoulders, feet, and hair, and expressed his intention of making love to her. Anatole had no notion and was incapable of considering what might come of such love-making, as he never had any notion of the outcome of any of his actions. "'She's first-rate, my dear fellow, but not for us,' replied Dolikov. "'I will tell my sister to ask her to dinner,' said Anatole. "'Eh? You'd better wait till she's married. "'You know, I adore little girls. They lose their heads at once,' pursued Anatole. "'You have been caught once already by a little girl.' said Dolikov, who knew of Karagin's marriage. "'Take care.' "'Well, that can't happen twice, eh?' said Anatole, with a good-humoured laugh. End of Book Eight, Chapter Eleven Book Eight, Chapter Twelve Of War and Peace, Volume Two 
by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Eight, Chapter Twelve. The day after the opera, the Rostovs went nowhere, and nobody came to see them. Maria Dmitrievna talked to the Count about something which they concealed from Natasha. Natasha guessed they were talking about the old prince and planning something, and this disquieted and offended her. She was expecting Prince Andrew any moment, and twice that day sent a manservant to the Vojvodzhenka to ascertain whether he had come. He had not arrived. She suffered more now than during her first days in Moscow. To her impatience and pining for him were now added the unpleasant recollection of her interview with Princess Mary and the old prince, and a fear and anxiety of which she did not understand the cause. She continually fancied that either he would never come, or that something would happen to her before he came. She could no longer think of him by herself calmly and continuously as she had done before. As soon as she began to think of him, the recollection of the old prince, of Princess Mary, of the theater, and of Karagin mingled with her thoughts. The question again presented itself whether she was not guilty whether she had not already broken faith with Prince Andrew, and again she found herself recalling to the minutest detail every word, every gesture, and every shade in the play of expression on the face of the man who had been able to arouse in her such an incomprehensible and terrifying feeling. To the family Natasha seemed livelier than usual, but she was far less tranquil and happy than before. On Sunday morning, Maria Dmitrievna invited her visitors to Mass at her parish church, the church of the Assumption built over the graves of victims of the plague. "'I don't like those fashionable churches,' she said, evidently priding herself on her independence of thought. "'God is the same everywhere. We have an excellent priest, he conducts the service decently and with dignity, and the deacon is the same. What holiness is there in giving concerts in the choir?' I don't like it. It's just self-indulgence." Maria Dmitrievna liked Sundays and knew how to keep them. Her whole house was scrubbed and cleaned on Saturdays. Neither she nor the servants worked, and they all wore holiday dress and went to church. At her table there were extra dishes at dinner, and the servants had vodka and roast goose or suckling pig but in nothing in the house was the holiday so noticeable as in Maria Dmitrievna's broad, stern face, which on that day wore an invariable look of solemn festivity. After Mass, when they had finished their coffee in the dining-room where the loose covers had been removed from the furniture, a servant announced that the carriage was ready, and Maria Dmitrievna rose with a stern air. She wore her holiday shawl, in which she paid calls, and announced that she was going to see Prince Nicholas Bolkonsky, to have an explanation with him about Natasha. After she had gone, a dressmaker from Madame Super Rouguet waited on the Rostovs, and Natasha, very glad of this diversion, having shut herself into a room adjoining the drawing-room, occupied herself trying on the new dresses. Just as she had put on a bodice without sleeves and only tacked together, and was turning her head to see in the glass how the back fitted, she heard in the drawing-room the animated sounds of her father's voice and another's, a woman's, that made her flush. It was Elaine. Natasha had not time to take off the bodice before the door opened, and Countess Bezukhova, dressed in a purple velvet gown with a high collar, came into the room beaming with good-humoured amiable smiles. "'Oh, my enchantress!' she cried to the blushing Natasha. "'Charming!' "'No. This is really beyond anything, my dear Count," said she to Count Rostov, who had followed her in. "'How can you live in Moscow and go nowhere? No, I won't let you off. Mademoiselle Georges will recite at my house tonight, and there'll be some people, and if you don't bring your lovely girls, who are prettier than Mademoiselle Georges, I won't know you. My husband is away in Tver, or I would send him to fetch you. You must come. You positively must between eight and nine." She nodded to the dressmaker, whom she knew, and who had curtsied respectfully to her, and seated herself in an armchair beside the looking-glass, draping the folds of her velvet dress picturesquely. 
she did not cease chattering good-naturedly and gaily, continually praising Natasha's beauty. She looked at Natasha's dresses and praised them, as well as a new dress of her own made of metallic gauze, which she had received from Paris, and advised Natasha to have one like it. "'But anything suits you, my charmer,' she remarked. A smile of pleasure never left Natasha's face. She felt happy, and as if she were blossoming under the praise of this dear Countess Bezukhova, who had formerly seemed to her so unapproachable and important, and was now so kind to her. Natasha brightened up and felt almost in love with this woman, who was so beautiful and so kind. Elaine, for her part, was sincerely delighted with Natasha, and wished to give her a good time. Anatole had asked her to bring him and Natasha together, and she was calling on the Rostovs for that purpose. The idea of throwing her brother and Natasha together amused her. Though at one time in Petersburg she had been annoyed with Natasha for drawing Boris away, she did not think of that now, and in her own way heartily wished Natasha well. As she was leaving the Rostovs she called her protégé aside. My brother dined with me yesterday. We nearly died of laughter. He ate nothing and kept sighing for you, my charmer. He is madly, quite madly in love with you, my dear." Natasha blushed scarlet when she heard this. "'How she blushes! How she blushes, my pretty!' said Elaine. "'You must certainly come.' "'If you love somebody, my charmer, that is not a reason to shut yourself up. Even if you are engaged, I am sure your fiancé would wish you to go into society rather than be bored to death." So she knows I am engaged, and she and her husband Pierre, that good Pierre, have talked and laughed about this. So it's all right. And again, under Elaine's influence, what had seemed terrible now seemed simple and natural. And she is such a grande dame, so kind, and evidently likes me so much. And why not enjoy myself? thought Natasha, gazing at Elaine with wide open, wondering eyes. Maria Dmitrievna came back to dinner taciturn and serious, having evidently suffered a defeat at the old prince's. She was still too agitated by the encounter to be able to talk of the affair calmly. In answer to the Count's inquiries, she replied that things were all right, and that she would tell about it next day. On hearing of Countess Bezakova's visit and the invitation for that evening, Maria Dmitrievna remarked, "'I don't care to have anything to do with Bezakova, and don't advise you to. However, if you've promised, go. It will divert your thoughts,' she added, addressing Natasha. End of Book 8, Chapter 12book 8 chapter 13 of war and peace volume 2 by leo tolstoy translated by elmer maud this librivox recording is in the public domain book 8 chapter 13 count rostov took the girls to countess bezukhova's there were a good many people there but nearly all strangers to natasha count rostov was displeased to see that the company consisted almost entirely of men and women known for the freedom of their conduct. Mademoiselle Georges was standing in a corner of the drawing-room, surrounded by young men. There were several Frenchmen present, among them Metivier, who from the time Elaine reached Moscow had been an intimate in her house. The Count decided not to sit down to cards or let his girls out of his sight, and to get away as soon as Mademoiselle Georges's performance was over. Anatole was at the door, evidently on the lookout for the Rostovs. Immediately after greeting the Count, he went up to Natasha and followed her. As soon as she saw him, she was seized by the same feeling she had had at the opera, gratified vanity at his admiration of her, and fear at the absence of a moral barrier between them. Elaine welcomed Natasha delightedly and was loud in admiration of her beauty and her dress. Soon after their arrival, Mademoiselle Georges went out of the room to change her costume. In the drawing-room people began arranging the chairs and taking their seats. Anatole moved a chair for Natasha, and was about to sit down beside her, 
but the Count, who never lost sight of her, took the seat himself. Anatole sat down behind her. Mademoiselle Georges, with her bare, fat, dimpled arms and a red shawl draped over one shoulder, came into the space left vacant for her, and assumed an unnatural pose. Enthusiastic whispering was audible. Mademoiselle Georges looked sternly and gloomily at the audience, and began reciting some French verses describing her guilty love for her son. In some places she raised her voice, in others she whispered, lifting her head triumphantly. Sometimes she paused and uttered hoarse sounds, rolling her eyes. "'Adorable! Divine! Delicious!' was heard from every side. Natasha looked at the fat actress, but neither saw nor heard nor understood anything of what went on before her. She only felt herself again completely borne away into this strange, senseless world, so remote from her old world, a world in which it was impossible to know what was good or bad, reasonable or senseless. Behind her sat Anatole, and conscious of his proximity she experienced a frightened sense of expectancy. After the first monologue the whole company rose and surrounded Mademoiselle Georges, expressing their enthusiasm. "'How beautiful she is!' Natasha remarked to her father, who had also risen and was moving through the crowd toward the actress. "'I don't think so when I look at you,' said Anatole, following Natasha. He said this at a moment when she alone could hear him. "'You are enchanting. From the moment I saw you I have never ceased—' "'Come, come, Natasha,' said the Count, as he turned back for his daughter. "'How beautiful she is!' Natasha, without saying anything, stepped up to her father and looked at him with surprised, inquiring eyes. After giving several recitations, Mademoiselle Georges left, and Countess Bezukhova asked her visitors into the ballroom. The Count wished to go home, but Elaine entreated him not to spoil her improvised ball, and the Rostovs stayed on. Anatole asked Natasha for a valse, and as they danced he pressed her waist and hand and told her she was bewitching and that he loved her. During the Ecossaise, which she also danced with him, Anatole said nothing when they happened to be by themselves, but merely gazed at her. Natasha lifted her frightened eyes to him, but there was such confident tenderness in his affectionate look and smile that she could not, whilst looking at him, say what she had to say. She lowered her eyes. Don't say such things to me. I am betrothed and love another," she said rapidly. She glanced at him. Anatole was not upset or pained by what she had said. Don't speak to me of that. What can I do?" said he. I tell you I am madly, madly in love with you. Is it my fault that you are enchanting? It's our turn to begin. Natasha, animated and excited, looked about her with wide-open, frightened eyes, and seemed merrier than usual. She understood hardly anything that went on that evening. They danced the Ecossais and the Grossvater. Her father asked her to come home, but she begged to remain. Wherever she went, and whomever she was speaking to, she felt his eyes upon her. Later on she recalled how she had asked her father to let her go to the dressing-room to rearrange her dress that Elaine had followed her and spoken laughingly of her brother's love, and that she again met Anatole in the little sitting-room. Elaine had disappeared, leaving them alone, and Anatole had taken her hand and said in a tender voice, "'I cannot come to visit you, but is it possible that I shall never see you? I love you madly. Can I never?' And blocking her path, he brought his face close to hers. His large, glittering, masculine eyes were so close to hers that she saw nothing but them. "'Natalie,' he whispered inquiringly while she felt her hands being painfully pressed. "'Natalie?' "'I don't understand. I have nothing to say,' her eyes replied. Burning lips were pressed to hers, and at the same instant she felt herself released, and Elaine's footsteps and the rustle of her dress were heard in the room. Natasha looked round at her, and then, red and trembling, threw a frightened look of inquiry at Anatole and moved toward the door. "'One word! Just one, for God's sake!' cried Anatole. She paused. 
She so wanted a word from him that would explain to her what had happened and to which she could find no answer. "'Natalie, just a word, only one!' He kept repeating, evidently not knowing what to say, and he repeated it till Elaine came up to them. Elaine returned with Natasha to the drawing-room. The Rostovs went away without staying for supper. After reaching home, Natasha did not sleep all night. She was tormented by the insoluble question whether she loved Anatole or Prince Andrew. She loved Prince Andrew, she remembered distinctly how deeply she loved him. But she also loved Anatole, of that there was no doubt. Else how could all this have happened? thought she. If after that I could return his smile when saying good-bye, if I was able to let it come to that, it means that I loved him from the first. It means that he is kind, noble, and splendid, and I could not help loving him. What am I to do if I love him and the other one too?" she asked herself, unable to find an answer to these terrible questions. End of Book Eight, Chapter Thirteen Book Eight Chapter Fourteen of War and Peace, Volume Two, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Eight, Chapter Fourteen. Morning came with its cares and bustle. Everyone got up and began to move about and talk. Dressmakers came again. Maria Dmitrievna appeared, and they were called to breakfast. Natasha kept looking uneasily at everybody with wide-open eyes, as if wishing to intercept every glance directed toward her, and tried to appear the same as usual. After breakfast, which was her best time, Maria Dmitrievna sat down in her armchair and called Natasha and the Count to her. "'Well, friends, I have now thought the whole matter over, and this is my advice,' she began. "'Yesterday, as you know, I went to see Prince Bolkonsky.' Well, I had a talk with him. He took it into his head to begin shouting, but I am not one to be shouted down. I said what I had to say. Well, and he? asked the Count. He? He's crazy. He did not want to listen. But what's the use of talking? As it is, we have worn the poor girl out, said Maria Dmitrievna. My advice to you is finish your business and go back home to Otradno and wait there." "'Oh, no!' exclaimed Natasha. "'Yes, go back,' said Maria Dmitrievna. "'And wait there. If your betrothed comes here now, there will be no avoiding a quarrel. But alone with the old man, he will talk things over and then come on to you.' Count Rostov approved of this suggestion, appreciating its reasonableness. If the old man came round, it would be all the better to visit him in Moscow or at Bald Hills later on, and if not, the wedding, against his wishes, could only be arranged at Otradno. "'That is perfectly true. And I am sorry I went to see him and took her,' said the old Count. "'No, why be sorry? Being here, you had to pay your respects. But if he won't, that's his affair,' said Maria Dmitrievna, looking for something in her reticule. Besides, the trousseau is ready, so there is nothing to wait for. And what is not ready, I'll send after you. Though I don't like letting you go, it is the best way. So go, with God's blessing." Having found what she was looking for in the reticule, she handed it to Natasha. It was a letter from Princess Mary. She has written to you. How she torments herself, poor thing! She's afraid you might think that she does not like you. But she doesn't like me," said Natasha. "'Don't talk nonsense,' cried Maria Dmitrievna. "'I shan't believe anyone. I know she doesn't like me,' replied Natasha boldly as she took the letter, and her face expressed a cold and angry resolution that caused Maria Dmitrievna to look at her more intently and to frown. "'Don't answer like that, my good girl,' she said. "'What I say is true. Write an answer.' Natasha did not reply and went to her own room to read Princess Mary's letter. 
Princess Mary wrote that she was in despair at the misunderstanding that had occurred between them. Whatever her father's feelings might be, she begged Natasha to believe that she could not help loving her as the one chosen by her brother, for whose happiness she was ready to sacrifice everything. "'Do not think, however,' she wrote, "'that my father is ill-disposed toward you. He is an invalid and an old man who must be forgiven. But he is good and magnanimous and will love her who makes his son happy.' Princess Mary went on to ask Natasha to fix a time when she could see her again. After reading the letter, Natasha sat down at the writing-table to answer it. "'Dear Princess,' she wrote in French quickly and mechanically, and then paused. What more could she write after all that had happened the evening before? "'Yes, yes. All that has happened, and now all is changed,' she thought as she sat with the letter she had begun before her. "'Must I break it off with him? Must I really? That's awful.' and to escape from these dreadful thoughts she went to Sonia and began sorting patterns with her. After dinner Natasha went to her room and again took up Princess Mary's letter. "'Can it be that it is all over?' she thought. "'Can it be that all this has happened so quickly and has destroyed all that went before?' She recalled her love for Prince Andrew in all its former strength, and at the same time felt that she loved Karagan. She vividly pictured herself as Prince Andrew's wife, and the scenes of happiness with him she had so often repeated in her imagination, and at the same time, aglow with excitement, recalled every detail of yesterday's interview with Anatole. "'Why could that not be as well?' she sometimes asked herself in complete bewilderment. "'Only so could I be completely happy, but now I have to choose, and I can't be happy without either of them.' Only, she thought, to tell Prince Andrew what has happened or to hide it from him are both equally impossible. But with that one nothing is spoiled. But am I really to abandon forever the joy of Prince Andrew's love in which I have lived so long? Please, miss, whispered a maid entering the room with a mysterious air. A man told me to give you this, and she handed Natasha a letter. Only for Christ's sake, the girl went on as Natasha, without thinking, mechanically broke the seal and read a love letter from Anatole, of which, without taking in a word, she understood only that it was a letter from him, from the man she loved. Yes, she loved him, or else how could that have happened which had happened? And how could she have a love letter from him in her hand? With trembling hands, Natasha held that passionate love letter which Dolokhov had composed for Anatole, and as she read it she found in it an echo of all that she herself imagined she was feeling. Since yesterday evening my fate has been sealed. To be loved by you or to die. There is no other way for me, the letter began. Then he went on to say that he knew her parents would not give her to him. For this there were secret reasons he could reveal only to her but that if she loved him she need only say the word yes, and no human power could hinder their bliss. Love would conquer all. He would steal her away and carry her off to the ends of the earth. "'Yes, yes, I love him,' thought Natasha, reading the letter for the twentieth time, and finding some peculiarly deep meaning in each word of it. That evening Maria Dmitrievna was going to the Akarovs and proposed to take the girls with her. Natasha, pleading a headache, remained at home. End of Book 8, Chapter 14「Book 8, Chapter 15 of War and Peace, Volume 2, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Eight, Chapter Fifteen. On returning late in the evening, Sonia went to Natasha's room, and to her surprise found her still dressed and asleep on the sofa. Open on the table beside her lay Anatole's letter. Sonia picked it up and read it. As she read, she glanced at the sleeping Natasha trying to find in her face an explanation of what she was reading, but did not find it. 
Her face was calm, gentle, and happy. Clutching her breast to keep herself from choking, Sonia, pale and trembling with fear and agitation, sat down in an armchair and burst into tears. "'How was it I noticed nothing? How could it go so far? Can she have left off loving Prince Andrew? And how could she let Karagan go to such lengths? He is a deceiver and a villain, that's plain. What will Nicholas, dear noble Nicholas, do when he hears of it? So this is the meaning of her excited, resolute, unnatural look the day before yesterday, yesterday and today," thought Sonia. But it can't be that she loves him. She probably opened the letter without knowing who it was from. Probably she is offended by it. She could not do such a thing. Sonia wiped away her tears and went up to Natasha, again scanning her face. Natasha, she said just audibly. Natasha awoke and saw Sonia. Ah, you're back. And with the decision and tenderness that often come at the moment of awakening, she embraced her friend, but noticing Sonia's look of embarrassment, her own face expressed confusion and suspicion. Sonia, you've read that letter? she demanded. Yes, answered Sonia softly. Natasha smiled rapturously. No, Sonia, I can't any longer, she said. I can't hide it from you any longer. You know, we love one another. Sonia, darling, he writes... Sonia... Sonia stared open-eyed at Natasha, unable to believe her ears. And Bolkonsky? she asked. Ah, Sonia, if you only knew how happy I am, cried Natasha. You don't know what love is. But, Natasha, can that be all over?" Natasha looked at Sonia with wide-open eyes, as if she could not grasp the question. "'Well, then, are you refusing Prince Andrew?' said Sonia. "'Oh, you don't understand anything. Don't talk nonsense, just listen,' said Natasha with momentary vexation. "'But I can't believe it,' insisted Sonia. "'I don't understand.' How is it you have loved a man for a whole year, and suddenly... Why, you have only seen him three times. Natasha, I don't believe you. You're joking. In three days to forget everything, and so... Three days, said Natasha. It seems to me I've loved him a hundred years. It seems to me that I have never loved anyone before. You can't understand it. Sonia, wait a bit. Sit here and Natasha embraced and kissed her. I had heard that it happens like this, and you must have heard it too, but it's only now that I feel such love. It's not the same as before. As soon as I saw him, I felt he was my master and I his slave, and that I could not help loving him. Yes, his slave. Whatever he orders, I shall do. You don't understand that. What can I do? What can I do, Sonia? cried Natasha with a happy yet frightened expression. But think what you are doing, cried Sonia. I can't leave it like this. This secret correspondence. How could you let him go so far? she went on with a horror and disgust she could hardly conceal. I told you that I have no will, Natasha replied. Why can't you understand? I love him. Then I won't let it come to that. I shall tell," cried Sonia, bursting into tears. What do you mean? For God's sake, if you tell, you are my enemy," declared Natasha. You want me to be miserable. You want us to be separated. When she saw Natasha's fright, Sonia shed tears of shame and pity for her friend. But what has happened between you? she asked. What has he said to you? Why doesn't he come to the house?" Natasha did not answer her questions. "'For God's sake, Sonia, don't tell anyone. Don't torture me,' Natasha entreated. "'Remember, no one ought to interfere in such matters. I have confided in you. But why this secrecy? Why doesn't he come to the house?' asked Sonia. "'Why doesn't he openly ask for your hand?' 
You know Prince Andrew gave you complete freedom, if it is really so, but I don't believe it. Natasha, have you considered what these secret reasons can be? Natasha looked at Sonia with astonishment. Evidently, this question presented itself to her mind for the first time, and she did not know how to answer it. I don't know what the reasons are, but there must be reasons. Sonia sighed and shook her head incredulously. If there were reasons, she began. But Natasha, guessing her doubts, interrupted her in alarm. Sonia, one can't doubt him. One can't, one can't. Don't you understand? she cried. Does he love you? Does he love me? Natasha repeated with a smile of pity at her friend's lack of comprehension. Why, you have read his letter, and you have seen him. But if he is dishonorable? He? Dishonorable? If you only knew! exclaimed Natasha. If he is an honorable man, he should either declare his intentions or cease seeing you. And if you won't do this, I will. I will write to him, and I will tell Papa, said Sonia resolutely. But I can't live without him! cried Natasha. Natasha, I don't understand you. And what are you saying? Think of your father and of Nicholas. I don't want anyone. I don't love anyone but him. How dare you say he is dishonorable? Don't you know that I love him? screamed Natasha. Go away, Sonia. I don't want to quarrel with you, but go, for God's sake, go. You see how I am suffering? Natasha cried angrily in a voice of despair and repressed irritation. Sonia burst into sobs and ran from the room. Natasha went to the table, and without a moment's reflection wrote that answer to Princess Mary which she had been unable to write all the morning. In this letter she said briefly that all their misunderstandings were at an end. That availing herself of the magnanimity of Prince Andrew, who, when he went abroad, had given her her freedom, she begged Princess Mary to forget everything, and forgive her if she had been to blame toward her, but that she could not be his wife. At that moment this all seemed quite easy, simple, and clear to Natasha. On Friday the Rostovs were to return to the country, but on Wednesday the Count went with the prospective purchaser to his estate near Moscow. On the day the Count left, Sonia and Natasha were invited to a big dinner party at the Karagins, and Maria Dmitrievna took them there. At that party Natasha again met Anatole, and Sonia noticed that she spoke to him, trying not to be overheard, and that all through dinner she was more agitated than ever. When they got home, Natasha was the first to begin the explanation Sonia expected. There, Sonia, you were talking all sorts of nonsense about him. Natasha began in a mild voice, such as children use when they wish to be praised. We have had an explanation today. Well, what happened? What did he say? Natasha, how glad I am you're not angry with me. Tell me everything, the whole truth. What did he say? Natasha became thoughtful. Oh, Sonia, if you knew him as I do! He said, he asked me what I had promised Bolkonsky. He was glad I was free to refuse him. Sonia sighed sorrowfully. But you haven't refused Bolkonsky, said she. Perhaps I have. Perhaps all is over between me and Bolkonsky. Why do you think so badly of me? I don't think anything, only I don't understand this. Wait a bit, Sonia, you'll understand everything. You'll see what a man he is. Now don't think badly of me or of him. I don't think badly of anyone. I love and pity everybody. But what am I to do? Sonia did not succumb to the tender tone Natasha used toward her. The more emotional and ingratiating the expression of Natasha's face became, the more serious and stern grew Sonia's. Natasha, said she, you asked me not to speak to you, and I haven't spoken, but now you yourself have begun. I don't trust him, Natasha. Why this secrecy? Again, again, interrupted Natasha. 
Natasha, I am afraid for you. Afraid of what? I am afraid you're going to your ruin, said Sonia resolutely, and was herself horrified at what she had said. Anger again showed in Natasha's face. And I'll go to my ruin, I will, as soon as possible. It's not your business. It won't be you, but I who'll suffer. Leave me alone, leave me alone. I hate you. Natasha, moaned Sonia, aghast. I hate you, I hate you. You're my enemy forever. And Natasha ran out of the room. Natasha did not speak to Sonia again and avoided her. With the same expression of agitated surprise and guilt, she went about the house, taking up now one occupation, now another, and at once abandoning them. Hard as it was for Sonia, she watched her friend and did not let her out of her sight. The day before the Count was to return, Sonia noticed that Natasha sat by the drawing-room window all the morning, as if expecting something, and that she made a sign to an officer who drove past, whom Sonia took to be Anatole. Sonia began watching her friend still more attentively, and noticed that at dinner and all that evening Natasha was in a strange and unnatural state. She answered questions at random, began sentences she did not finish, and laughed at everything. After tea, Sonia noticed a housemaid at Natasha's door, timidly waiting to let her pass. She let the girl go in, and then, listening at the door, learned that another letter had been delivered. Then suddenly it became clear to Sonia that Natasha had some dreadful plan for that evening. Sonia knocked at her door. Natasha did not let her in. She will run away with him, thought Sonia. She is capable of anything. There was something particularly pathetic and resolute in her face today. She cried as she said good-bye to Uncle, Sonia remembered. Yes, that's it. She means to elope with him. But what am I to do? thought she, recalling all the signs that clearly indicated that Natasha had some terrible intention. The Count is away. What am I to do? Write to Karagin demanding an explanation? But what is there to oblige him to reply? Write to Pierre, as Prince Andrew asked me to do in case of some misfortune? But perhaps she really has already refused Bolkonsky. She sent a letter to Prince Mary yesterday. And Uncle is away. To tell Maria Dmitrievna, who had such faith in Natasha, seemed to Sonia terrible. Well, anyway, thought Sonia, as she stood in the dark passage, now or never I must prove that I remember the family's goodness to me and that I love Nicholas. Yes, if I don't sleep for three nights, I'll not leave this passage and will hold her back by force and will and not let the family be disgraced, thought she. End of Book 8, Chapter 15book 8 chapter 16 of war and peace volume 2 by leo tolstoy translated by elmer maud this librivox recording is in the public domain book 8 chapter 16 anatole had lately moved to dolikovs the plan for natalie rostova's abduction had been arranged and the preparations made by dolikov a few days before and on the day that Sonia, after listening at Natasha's door, resolved to safeguard her, it was to have been put into execution. Natasha had promised to come out to Karagin at the back porch at ten that evening. Karagin was to put her into a troika he would have ready, and to drive her forty miles to the village of Kamenka, where an unfrocked priest was in readiness to perform a marriage ceremony over them. At Kamenka, a relay of horses was to wait which would take them to the Warsaw High Road, and from there they would hasten abroad with post-horses. Anatole had a passport, an order for post-horses, ten thousand roubles he had taken from his sister, and another ten thousand borrowed with Dolikov's help. Two witnesses for the mock marriage, Kvostikov, a retired petty official whom Dolikov made use of in his gambling transactions, and Makarin, a retired hussar, a kindly weak fellow who had an unbounded affection for Karagin, were sitting at tea in Dolikov's front room. 
In his large study, the walls of which were hung to the ceiling with Persian rugs, bearskins and weapons, sat Dolikov in a travelling cloak and high boots, at an open desk on which lay an abacus and some bundles of paper money. Anatole, with uniform unbuttoned, walked to and fro from the room where the witnesses were sitting through the study to the room behind, where his French valet and others were packing the last of his things. Dolikov was counting the money and noting something down. Well, he said, Kvostikov must have two thousand. Give it to him, then, said Anatole. Makarka, their name for Makarin, will go through fire and water for you for nothing. So here are our accounts all settled, said Dolikov, showing him the memorandum. Is that right? Yes, of course, returned Anatole, evidently not listening to Dolikov and looking straight before him with a smile that did not leave his face. Dolikov banged down the lid of his desk and turned to Anatole with an ironic smile. Do you know, you'd really better drop it all. There's still time. Fool, retorted Anatole, don't talk nonsense. If you only knew, it's the devil knows what. No, really, give it up, said Dolikov. I am speaking seriously. It's no joke, this plot you've hatched. What, teasing again? Go to the devil, eh? said Anatole, making a grimace. Really, it's no time for your stupid jokes. And he left the room. Dolikov smiled contemptuously and condescendingly when Anatole had gone out. You wait a bit he called after him. I'm not joking. I'm talking sense. Come here, come here." Anatole returned, and looked at Dolokhov, trying to give him his attention and evidently submitting to him involuntarily. "'Now listen to me. I'm telling you this for the last time. Why should I joke about it? Did I hinder you? Who arranged everything for you? Who found the priest and got the passport? Who raised the money? I did it all. Well, thank you for it. Do you think I am not grateful?" And Anatole sighed and embraced Dolikov. I helped you, but all the same I must tell you the truth. It is a dangerous business, and if you think about it, a stupid business. Well, you'll carry her off, all right. Will they let it stop at that? It will come out that you're already married. Why, they'll have you in the criminal court. Oh, nonsense, nonsense!" Anatole ejaculated and again made a grimace. Didn't I explain it to you, what? And Anatole, with a partiality dull-witted people have for any conclusion they have reached by their own reasoning, repeated the argument he had already put to Dolikov a hundred times. Didn't I explain to you that I have come to this conclusion? If this marriage is invalid, he went on crooking one finger, then I have nothing to answer for. But if it is valid, no matter. Abroad, no one will know anything about it. Isn't that so? And don't talk to me, don't, don't!" Seriously, you'd better drop it. You'd only get yourself into a mess. Go to the devil! cried Anatole, and clutching his hair left the room, but returned at once and dropped into an armchair in front of Dolikov with his feet turned under him. It's the very devil, what? Feel how it beats!" He took Dolikov's hand and put it on his heart. "'What a foot, my dear fellow! What a glance! A goddess!' he added in French. What?" Dolikov with a cold smile and a gleam in his handsome, insolent eyes looked at him, evidently wishing to get some more amusement out of him. "'Well, and when the money's gone, what then?' What then, eh?" repeated Anatole, sincerely perplexed by a thought of the future. What then? Then? I don't know. But why talk nonsense? He glanced at his watch. It's time. Anatole went into the back room. Now then, nearly ready? You're dawdling, he shouted to the servants. Dolikov put away the money called a footman, whom he ordered to bring something for them to eat and drink before the journey, and went into the room where Kvostikov and Makarin were sitting. Anatole lay on the sofa in the study, leaning on his elbow and smiling pensively, 
while his handsome lips muttered tenderly to himself. "'Come and eat something. Have a drink!' Dolokhov shouted to him from the other room. "'I don't want to,' answered Anatole, continuing to smile. "'Come! Balaga is here!' Anatole rose and went into the dining-room. Balaga was a famous troika driver who had known Dolokhov and Anatole some six years, and had given them good service with his troikas. More than once, when Anatole's regiment was stationed at Tver, he had taken him from Tver in the evening, brought him to Moscow by daybreak, and driven him back again the next night. More than once he had enabled Dolokhov to escape when pursued. More than once he had driven them through the town with gypsies and ladykins, as he called the coquettes. More than once, in their service, he had run over pedestrians and upset vehicles in the streets of Moscow, and had always been protected from the consequences by my gentlemen, as he called them. He had ruined more than one horse in their service. More than once they had beaten him, and more than once they had made him drunk on champagne and Madeira, which he loved. And he knew more than one thing about each of them, which would long ago have sent an ordinary man to Siberia. They often called Balaga into their orgies and made him drink and dance at the gypsies, and more than one thousand roubles of their money had passed through his hands. In their service he risked his skin and his life twenty times a year, and in their service had lost more horses than the money he had from them would buy. But he liked them, liked that mad driving at twelve miles an hour, liked upsetting a driver or running down a pedestrian and flying at full gallop through the Moscow streets. He liked to hear those wild tipsy shouts behind him, "'Get on! Get on!' when it was impossible to go any faster. He liked giving a painful lash on the neck to some peasant, who, more dead than alive, was already hurrying out of his way. Real gentlemen, he considered them. Anatole and Dolokhov liked Balaga, too, for his masterly driving, and because he liked the things they liked. With others Balaga bargained, charging twenty-five roubles for a two-hours drive, and rarely drove himself, generally letting his young men do so. But with his gentlemen he always drove himself and never demanded anything for his work. Only a couple of times a year, when he knew from their valets that they had money in hand, would he turn up of a morning quite sober, and with a deep bow would ask them to help him. The gentleman always made him sit down. "'Do help me out, Theodore Ivanitch, sir, or Your Excellency,' he would say. "'I am quite out of horses. Let me have what you can to go to the fair.' And Anatole and Dolokhov, when they had money, would give him a thousand or a couple of thousand roubles. Balaga was a fair-haired, short and snub-nosed peasant of about twenty-seven red-faced, with a particularly red thick neck, glittering little eyes, and a small beard. He wore a fine, dark-blue, silk-lined cloth coat over a sheepskin. On entering the room now he crossed himself, turning toward the front corner of the room, and went up to Dolokhov, holding out a small black hand. "'Theodore Ivanitch,' he said, bowing. "'How do you do, friend? Well, here he is.' "'Good day, Your Excellency,' he said, again holding out his hand to Anatole, who had just come in. "'I say, Balaga,' said Anatole, putting his hands on the man's shoulders, "'do you care for me or not, eh? Now, do me a service. What horses have you come with, eh?' "'As your messenger ordered, your special beasts,' replied Balaga. "'Well, listen, Balaga. Drive all three to death, but get me there in three hours, eh?' When they are dead, what shall I drive? said Balaga with a wink. Mind, I'll smash your face in. Don't make jokes, cried Anatole, suddenly rolling his eyes. Why joke? said the driver, laughing. As if I'd grudge my gentleman anything. As fast as ever the horses can gallop, so fast we'll go. Ah, said Anatole, well, sit down. Yes, sit down, said Dolokhov. I'll stand, Theodore Ivanitch. Sit down, nonsense. Have a drink, said Anatole, and filled a large glass of Madeira for him. The driver's eyes sparkled at the sight of the wine. After refusing it for manner's sake, 
He drank it and wiped his mouth with a red silk handkerchief he took out of his cap. "'And when are we to start, Your Excellency?' "'Well,' Anatole looked at his watch, "'we'll start at once. Mind, Balaga, you'll get there in time, eh?' "'That depends on our luck in starting, else why shouldn't we be there in time?' replied Balaga. "'Didn't we get you to Tver in seven hours? I think you remember that, Your Excellency.' "'Do you know one Christmas I drove from Tver?' said Anatole, smilingly at the recollection and turning to Makarin, who gazed rapturously at him with wide-open eyes. "'Will you believe it, Makarka? It took one's breath away the rate we flew. We came across a train of loaded sleighs and drove right over two of them. Eh?' "'Those were horses,' Balaga continued the tale. That time I'd harnessed two young side-horses with the bay in the shafts," he went on, turning to Dolokhov. "'Will you believe it, Theodor Ivanitch? Those animals flew forty miles. I couldn't hold them in. My hands grew numb in the sharp frost, so that I threw down the reins. "'Catch hold yourself, Your Excellency,' says I, and I just tumbled on the bottom of the sleigh and sprawled there. It wasn't a case of urging them on. There was no holding them in till we reached the place. The devils took us there in three hours. Only the near one died of it. End of Book 8, Chapter 16「Book 8, Chapter 17 of War and Peace, Volume 2, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Eight, Chapter Seventeen. Anatole went out of the room and returned a few minutes later, wearing a fur coat girt with a silver belt, and a sable cap jauntily set on one side and very becoming to his handsome face. Having looked in a mirror and standing before Dolokhov in the same pose he had assumed before it, he lifted a glass of wine. Well, good bye, Theodore. Thank you for everything and farewell," said Anatole. Well, comrades and friends, he considered for a moment. Of my youth, farewell, he said, turning to Makarin and the others. Though they were all going with him, Anatole evidently wished to make something touching and solemn out of this address to his comrades. He spoke slowly in a loud voice and throwing out his chest slightly swayed one leg. I'll take glasses. You too, Belaga. Well, comrades and friends of my youth, we've had our fling and lived and reveled, eh? And now, when shall we meet again? I am going abroad. We have had a good time. Now, farewell, lads. To our health! Hurrah! he cried, and emptying his glass, flung it on the floor. To your health! said Balaga, who also emptied his glass and wiped his mouth with his handkerchief. Makarin embraced Anatole with tears in his eyes. "'Ah, Prince, how sorry I am to part from you!' "'Let's go, let's go!' cried Anatole. Balaga was about to leave the room. "'No, stop!' said Anatole. "'Shut the door. We have first to sit down. That's the way.' They shut the door and all sat down. "'Now, quick march, lads!' said Anatole, rising. Joseph, his valet, handed him his sabretache and sabre, and they all went out into the vestibule. "'And where's the fur cloak?' asked Dolokhov. "'Hey, Ignatka, go to Matrena Matrevna and ask her for the sable cloak. I have heard what elopements are like,' continued Dolokhov with a wink. "'Why, she'll rush out more dead than alive just in the things she is wearing. If you delay at all, There'll be tears, and Papa, and Mama, and she's frozen in a minute and must go back. But you wrap the fur cloak round her first thing and carry her to the sleigh." The valet brought a woman's fox-lined cloak. "'Fool, I told you the sable one! Hey, Matrena, the sable!' he shouted so that his voice rang far through the rooms. A handsome, slim, and pale-faced gypsy girl with glittering black eyes and curly blue-black hair, wearing a red shawl, ran out with a sable mantle on her arm. "'Here, I don't grudge it. Take it,' she said, 
evidently afraid of her master and yet regretful of her cloak. Dolokhov, without answering, took the cloak, threw it over Matrena, and wrapped her up in it. "'That's the way,' said Dolokhov. "'And then so!' And he turned up the collar round her head, leaving only a little of the face uncovered. "'And then so, do you see?' And he pushed Anatole's head forward to meet the gap left by the collar, through which Matrena's brilliant smile was seen. "'Well, good-bye, Matrena,' said Anatole, kissing her. Ah, my revels here are over. Remember me to Steshka. There, good-bye. Good-bye, Matrena. Wish me luck. Well, Prince, may God give you a great luck, said Matrena in her gypsy accent. Two troikas were standing before the porch, and two young drivers were holding the horses. Balaga took his seat in the front one, and holding his elbows high, arranged the reins deliberately. Anatole and Dolokhov got in with him. Makarin, Kvostikov, and a valet seated themselves in the other sleigh. "'Well, are you ready?' asked Balaga. "'Go!' he cried, twisting the reins round his hands, and the troikas tore down the Nikitsky Boulevard. "'Tupru! Get out of the way! Hi! Tupru!' The shouting of Balaga and of the sturdy young fellow seated on the box was all that could be heard. On the Arbat Square the troika caught against a carriage. Something cracked, shouts were heard, and the troika flew along the Arbat Street. After taking a turn along the Podnovinsky Boulevard, Balaga began to rein in, and turning back drew up at the crossing of the old Konyushiny Street. The young fellow on the box jumped down to hold the horses, and Anatole and Dolokhov went along the pavement. When they reached the gate, Dolokhov whistled. The whistle was answered, and a maidservant ran out. "'Come into the courtyard, or you'll be seen. She'll come out directly,' said she. Dolokhov stayed by the gate. Anatole followed the maid into the courtyard, turned the corner, and ran up into the porch. He was met by Gabriel, Maria Dmitrievna's gigantic footman. "'Come to the mistress, please,' said the footman in his deep bass, intercepting any retreat. "'To what mistress? Who are you?' asked Anatole in a breathless whisper. Kindly step in. My orders are to bring you in. Karagin, come back! shouted Dolokhov. Betrayed! Back! Dolokhov, after Anatole entered, had remained at the wicket gate and was struggling with the yard porter who was trying to lock it. With a last desperate effort, Dolokhov pushed the porter aside, and when Anatole ran back, seized him by the arm, pulled him through the wicket, and ran back with him to the troika. End of Book 8, Chapter 17「Book 8, Chapter 18, Of War and Peace, Volume 2, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book 8, Chapter 18 Maria Dmitrievna, having found Sonia weeping in the corridor, made her confess everything, and, intercepting the note to Natasha, she read it and went into Natasha's room with it in her hand. "'You shameless good-for-nothing!' said she. "'I won't hear a word!' Pushing back Natasha, who looked at her with astonished but tearless eyes, she locked her in, and having given orders to the yard-porter to admit the persons who would be coming that evening, but not to let them out again, and having told the footman to bring them to her, she seated herself in the drawing-room to await the abductors. When Gabriel came to inform her that the men who had come had run away again, she rose frowning, and clasping her hands behind her, paced through the rooms a long time, considering what she should do. Toward midnight she went to Natasha's room fingering the key in her pocket. Sonia was sitting sobbing in the corridor. "'Maria Dmitrievna, for God's sake, let me into her,' she pleaded but Maria Dmitrievna unlocked the door and went in without giving her an answer. "'Disgusting! Abominable! In my house! Horrid girl! Hussy! I'm only sorry for her father!' thought she, trying to restrain her wrath. "'Hard as it may be, I'll tell them all to hold their tongues and will hide it from the Count.' She entered the room with resolute steps. Natasha, lying on the sofa, her head hidden in her hands, and she did not stir. 
She was in just the same position in which Maria Dmitrievna had left her. "'A nice girl, very nice,' said Maria Dmitrievna. "'Arranging meetings with lovers in my house. It's no use pretending. You listen when I speak to you.' And Maria Dmitrievna touched her arm. "'Listen when I speak. You've disgraced yourself like the lowest of hussies. I treat you differently, but I'm sorry for your father, so I will conceal it.' Natasha did not change her position, but her whole body heaved with noiseless, convulsive sobs which choked her. Maria Dmitrievna glanced round at Sonia and seated herself on the sofa beside Natasha. "'It's lucky for him that he escaped me, but I'll find him,' she said in her rough voice. "'Do you hear what I am saying or not?' she added. She put her large hand under Natasha's face and turned it toward her. Both Maria Dmitrievna and Sonia were amazed when they saw how Natasha looked. Her eyes were dry and glistened, her lips compressed, her cheeks sunken. "'Let me be! What is it to me? I shall die!' she muttered, wrenching herself from Maria Dmitrievna's hands with a vicious effort and sinking down again into her former position. "'Natalie,' said Maria Dmitrievna, "'I wish for your good. Lie still. Stay like that, then. I won't touch you. But listen. I won't tell you how guilty you are. You know that yourself. But when your father comes back tomorrow, what am I to tell him, eh?" Again Natasha's body shook with sobs. "'Suppose he finds out, and your brother, and your betrothed.' "'I have no betrothed. I have refused him,' cried Natasha. "'That's all the same.' continued Maria Dmitrievna. If they hear of this, will they let it pass? He, your father? I know him. If he challenges him to a duel, will that be all right, eh? Oh, let me be! Why have you interfered at all? Why, why? Who asked you to? shouted Natasha, raising herself on the sofa and looking malignantly at Maria Dmitrievna. But what do you want? cried Maria Dmitrievna, growing angry again. Were you kept under lock and key? Who hindered his coming to the house? Why carry you off as if you were some gypsy singing girl? Well, if he had carried you off, do you think they wouldn't have found him? Your father, or brother, or your betrothed? And he's a scoundrel, a wretch, that's a fact. He is better than any of you, exclaimed Natasha, getting up. If you hadn't interfered! Oh, my God! What is it all? What is it? Sonia, why? Go away!" And she burst into sobs, with the despairing vehemence with which people bewail disasters they feel they have themselves occasioned. Maria Dmitrievna was about to speak again, but Natasha cried out, "'Go away! Go away! You all hate and despise me!' and she threw herself back on the sofa. Maria Dmitrievna went on admonishing her for some time, enjoining on her that it must all be kept from her father, and assuring her that nobody would know anything about it if only Natasha herself would undertake to forget it all, and not let anyone see that something had happened. Natasha did not reply, nor did she sob any longer, but she grew cold and had a shivering fit. Maria Dmitrievna put a pillow under her head, covered her with two quilts, and herself brought her some lime-flower water, but Natasha did not respond to her. "'Well, let her sleep,' said Maria Dmitrievna, as she went out of the room, supposing Natasha to be asleep. But Natasha was not asleep. With pale face and fixed wide-open eyes, she looked straight before her. All that night she did not sleep or weep and did not speak to Sonia, who got up and went to her several times. Next day Count Rostov returned from his estate near Moscow in time for lunch as he had promised. He was in very good spirits. The affair with the purchaser was going on satisfactorily, and there was nothing to keep him any longer in Moscow, away from the countess whom he missed. Maria Dmitrievna met him and told him that Natasha had been very unwell the day before, and that they had sent for the doctor, but that she was better now. 
Natasha had not left her room that morning. With compressed and parched lips and dry fixed eyes she sat at the window, uneasily watching the people who drove past, and hurriedly glancing round at anyone who entered the room. She was evidently expecting news of him, and that he would come or would write to her. When the Count came to see her she turned anxiously round at the sound of a man's footstep, and then her face resumed its cold and malevolent expression. She did not even get up to greet him. "'What is the matter with you, my angel? Are you ill?' asked the Count. After a moment's silence Natasha answered, "'Yes, ill.' In reply to the Count's anxious inquiries as to why she was so dejected and whether anything had happened to her betrothed, she answered him that nothing had happened and asked him not to worry. Maria Dmitrievna confirmed Natasha's assurances that nothing had happened. From the pretense of illness, from his daughter's distress, and by the embarrassed faces of Sonia and Maria Dmitrievna, the Count saw clearly that something had gone wrong during his absence, but it was terrible for him to think that anything disgraceful had happened to his beloved daughter, and he so prized his own cheerful tranquillity that he avoided inquiries and tried to assure himself that nothing particularly had happened, and he was only dissatisfied that her indisposition delayed their return to the country. End of Book 8, Chapter 18《Book Eight, Chapter Nineteen, of War and Peace, Volume Two by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. • Book Eight, Chapter Nineteen. • From the day his wife arrived in Moscow, Pierre had been intending to go away somewhere so as not to be near her. Soon after the Rostovs came to Moscow, the effect Natasha had on him made him hasten to carry out his intention. He went to Tver, to see Joseph Alexeyevich's widow, who had long since promised to hand over to him some papers of her deceased husband's. When he returned to Moscow, Pierre was handed a letter from Maria Dmitrievna asking him to come and see her on a matter of great importance relating to Andrew Bolkonsky and his betrothed. Pierre had been avoiding Natasha because it seemed to him that his feeling for her was stronger than a married man should be for his friend's fiancée. Yet some fate constantly threw them together. "'What can have happened? And what can they want with me?' thought he as he dressed to go to Maria Dmitrievna's. "'If only Prince Andrew would hurry up and come and marry her,' thought he on his way to the house. On the Tverskoy Boulevard a familiar voice called to him. "'Pierre! Been back long?' someone shouted. Pierre raised his head. In a sleigh drawn by two gray trotting horses that were bespattering the dashboard with snow, Anatole and his constant companion Makarin dashed past. Anatole was sitting upright in the classic pose of military dandies, the lower part of his face hidden by his beaver collar and his head slightly bent. His face was fresh and rosy, his white-plumed hat, tilted to one side, disclosed his curled and pomaded hair besprinkled with powdery snow. "'Yes, indeed, that's a true sage,' thought Pierre. "'He sees nothing beyond the pleasure of the moment, nothing troubles him, and so he is always cheerful, satisfied, and serene. What wouldn't I give to be like him?' he thought enviously. In Maria Dmitrievna's anteroom, the footman who helped him off with his fur coat said that the mistress asked him to come to her bedroom. When he opened the ballroom door Pierre saw Natasha sitting at the window, with a thin, pale and spiteful face. She glanced round at him, frowned, and left the room with an expression of cold dignity. "'What has happened?' asked Pierre, entering Maria Dmitrievna's room. "'Fine doings!' answered Dmitrievna. For fifty-eight years have I lived in this world and never known anything so disgraceful." And having put him on his honor not to repeat anything she told him, Maria Dmitrievna informed him that Natasha had refused Prince Andrew without her parents' knowledge, and that the cause of this was Anatole Karagin into whose society Pierre's wife had thrown her, 
and with whom Natasha had tried to elope during her father's absence, in order to be married secretly. Pierre raised his shoulders and listened open-mouthed to what was told him, scarcely able to believe his own ears. That Prince Andrew's deeply loved affianced wife, the same Natasha Rostova, who used to be so charming, should give up Bolkonsky for that fool Anatole, who was already secretly married, as Pierre knew, and should be so in love with him as to agree to run away with him, was something Pierre could not conceive and could not imagine. He could not reconcile the charming impression he had of Natasha, whom he had known from a child, with this new conception of her baseness, folly, and cruelty. He thought of his wife. "'They are all alike,' he said to himself, reflecting that he was not the only man unfortunate enough to be tied to a bad woman. But still he pitied Prince Andrew to the point of tears, and sympathized with his wounded pride and the more he pitied his friend, the more did he think with contempt and even with disgust of that Natasha who had just passed him in the ballroom, with such a look of cold dignity. He did not know that Natasha's soul was overflowing with despair, shame, and humiliation, and that it was not her fault that her face happened to assume an expression of calm dignity and severity. "'But how get married?' said Pierre in answer to Maria Dmitrievna. He could not marry. He is married. Things get worse from hour to hour," ejaculated Maria Dmitrievna. A nice youth! What a scoundrel! And she is expecting him, expecting him since yesterday. She must be told. Then, at least, she won't go on expecting him. After hearing the details of Anatole's marriage from Pierre, and giving vent to her anger against Anatole in words of abuse, Maria Dmitrievna told Pierre why she had sent for him. She was afraid that the Count or Bolkonsky, who might arrive at any moment, if they knew of this affair, which she hoped to hide from them, might challenge Anatole to a duel, and she therefore asked Pierre to tell his brother-in-law in her name to leave Moscow and not dare to let her eyes set eyes on him again. Pierre, only now realizing the danger to the old Count, Nicholas, and Prince Andrew, promised to do as she wished. Having briefly and exactly explained her wishes to him, she let him go to the drawing-room. "'Mind, the Count knows nothing. Behave as if you know nothing either,' she said. "'And I will go and tell her it is no use expecting him. "'And stay to dinner if you care to,' she called after Pierre. Pierre met the old Count, who seemed nervous and upset. That morning Natasha had told him that she had rejected Bolkonsky. "'Troubles, troubles, my dear fellow,' he said to Pierre. "'What troubles one has with these girls without their mother! I do so regret having come here. I will be frank with you. Have you heard she has broken off her engagement without consulting anybody?' "'It's true this engagement never was much to my liking. Of course he is an excellent man, but still, with his father's disapproval, they wouldn't have been happy.' and Natasha won't lack suitors. Still, it has been going on so long, and to take such a step without father's or mother's consent, and now she's ill, and God knows what. It's hard, Count, hard to manage daughters in their mother's absence." Pierre saw that the Count was much upset and tried to change the subject, but the Count returned to his troubles. Sonia entered the room with an agitated face. Natasha is not quite well. She's in her room and would like to see you. Maria Dmitrievna is with her, and she too asks you to come. Yes, you are a great friend of Bolkonsky's. No doubt she wants to send him a message," said the Count. Oh, dear, oh, dear! How happy it all was! And clutching the spare gray locks on his temples, the Count left the room. When Maria Dmitrievna told Natasha that Anatole was married, Natasha did not wish to believe it, and insisted on having it confirmed by Pierre himself. Sonia told Pierre this as she led him along the corridor to Natasha's room. Natasha, pale and stern, was sitting beside Maria Dmitrievna, and her eyes, glittering feverishly, met Pierre with a questioning look the moment he entered. 
She did not smile or nod, but only gazed fixedly at him, and her look asked only one thing. Was he a friend, or like the others, an enemy in regard to Anatole? As for Pierre, he evidently did not exist for her. "'He knows all about it,' said Maria Dmitrievna, pointing to Pierre and addressing Natasha. "'Let him tell you whether I have told the truth.' Natasha looked from one to the other as a hunted and wounded animal looks at the approaching dogs and sportsmen. "'Natalia Ilinichna, Pierre began, dropping his eyes with a feeling of pity for her and loathing for the thing he had to do. "'Whether it is true or not should make no difference to you, because—' "'Then it is not true that he's married?' "'Yes, it is true.' "'Has he been married long?' she asked. On your honor? Pierre gave his word of honor. Is he still here? she asked quickly. Yes, I have just seen him. She was evidently unable to speak and made a sign with her hands that they should leave her alone. End of Book Eight, Chapter Nineteen. Book Eight, Chapter Twenty. Of War and Peace, Volume Two, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Eight, Chapter Twenty. Pierre did not stay for dinner, but left the room and went away at once. He drove through the town seeking Anatole Karagin, at the thought of whom now the blood rushed to his heart and he felt a difficulty in breathing. He was not at the Ice Hills, nor at the Gypsies, nor at Comominos. Pierre drove to the club. In the club all was going on as usual. The members who were assembling for dinner were sitting about in groups. They greeted Pierre and spoke of the town news. The footman, having greeted him, knowing his habits and his acquaintances, told him there was a place left for him in the small dining-room, and that Prince Michael Zakarich was in the library but Paul Timoveyevich had not yet arrived. One of Pierre's acquaintances, while they were talking about the weather, asked if he had heard of Karagin's abduction of Rostova, which was talked of in the town, and was it true? Pierre laughed and said it was nonsense, for he had just come from the Rostovs. He asked everyone about Anatole. One man told him he had not come yet, and another that he was coming to dinner. Pierre felt it strange to see this calm, indifferent crowd of people unaware of what was going on in his soul. He paced through the ballroom, waited till everyone had come, and as Anatole had not turned up, did not stay for dinner, but drove home. Anatole, for whom Pierre was looking, dined that day with Dolokhov, consulting him as to how to remedy this unfortunate affair. It seemed to him essential to see Natasha. In the evening he drove to his sister's to discuss with her how to arrange a meeting. When Pierre returned home after vainly hunting all over Moscow, his valet informed him that Prince Anatole was with the Countess. The Countess' drawing-room was full of guests. Pierre, without greeting his wife, whom he had not seen since his return, at that moment she was more repulsive to him than ever, entered the drawing-room and seeing Anatole went up to him. Ah, Pierre, said the countess, going up to her husband, you don't know what a plight our Anatole. She stopped, seeing in the forward thrust of her husband's head, in his glowing eyes and his resolute gait, the terrible indications of that rage and strength which she knew and had herself experienced after his duel with Dolokhov. Where you are, there is vice and evil, said Pierre to his wife. Anatole, come with me. I must speak to you," he added in French. Anatole glanced round at his sister and rose submissively, ready to follow Pierre. Pierre, taking him by the arm, pulled him toward himself and was leading him from the room. "'If you allow yourself in my drawing-room,' whispered Elaine, but Pierre did not reply and went out of the room. Anatole followed him with his usual jaunty step, but his face betrayed anxiety. Having entered his study, Pierre closed the door and addressed Anatole without looking at him. "'You promised Countess Rostova to marry her, and were about to elope with her, is that so?' 
Mon cher, answered Anatole, their whole conversation was in French, I don't consider myself bound to answer questions put to me in that tone. Pierre's face, already pale, became distorted by fury. He seized Anatole by the collar of his uniform with his big hand and shook him from side to side, till Anatole's face showed a sufficient degree of terror. "'When I tell you that I must talk to you,' repeated Pierre. "'Come now, this is stupid, what?' said Anatole, fingering a button of his collar that had been wrenched loose with a bit of the cloth. "'You're a scoundrel and a blackguard, and I don't know what deprives me from the pleasure of smashing your head with this.' said Pierre, expressing himself so artificially because he was talking French. He took a heavy paperweight and lifted it threateningly, but at once put it back in its place. "'Did you promise to marry her?' "'I—I I didn't think of it. I never promised, because—' Pierre interrupted him. "'Have you any letters of hers? Any letters?' he said, moving toward Anatole. Anatole glanced at him, and immediately thrust his hand into his pocket and drew out his pocket-book. Pierre took the letter Anatole handed him, and pushing aside a table that stood in his way, threw himself on the sofa. "'I shan't be violent. Don't be afraid,' said Pierre, in answer to a frightened gesture of Anatole's. First, the letters,' said he, as if repeating a lesson to himself. Secondly, he continued after a short pause, again rising and again pacing the room. Tomorrow you must get out of Moscow. But how can I? Thirdly, Pierre continued without listening to him, you must never breathe a word of what has passed between you and Countess Rostova. I know I can't prevent your doing so, but if you have a spark of conscience... Pierre paced the room several times in silence. Anatole sat at a table, frowning and biting his lips. "'After all, you must understand that, besides your pleasure, there is such a thing as other people's happiness and peace, and that you are ruining a whole life for the sake of amusing yourself. Amuse yourself with women like my wife. With them you are within your rights, for they know what you want of them. They are armed against you by the same experience of debauchery. But to promise a maid to marry her, to deceive, to kidnap! Don't you understand that it is as mean as beating an old man or a child?" Pierre paused and looked at Anatole no longer with an angry but with a questioning look. "'I don't know about that, eh?' said Anatole, growing more confident as Pierre mastered his wrath. "'I don't know that and don't want to,' he said not looking at Pierre, and with a slight tremor of his lower jaw. But you have used such words to me, mean and so on, which, as a man of honor, I can't allow anyone to use." Pierre glanced at him with amazement, unable to understand what he wanted. "'Though it was tete-a-tete,' -tete, Anatole continued, "'still I can't.' "'Is it satisfaction you want?' said Pierre ironically. "'You could at least take back your words. What? If you want me to do as you wish, eh?' "'I take them back. I take them back,' said Pierre. "'And I ask you to forgive me.' Pierre involuntarily glanced at the loose button. "'And if you require money for your journey—' Anatole smiled. The expression of that base and cringing smile which Pierre knew so well in his wife revolted him. "'Oh, vile and heartless brood!' he exclaimed, and left the room. Next day Anatole left for Petersburg. End of Book 8 Chapter 20《Of War and Peace》Volume 2 by Leo Tolstoy Translated by Elmer Maud This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book 8, Chapter 21 Pierre drove to Maria Dmitrievna's to tell her of the fulfillment of her wish that Karagin should be banished from Moscow. The whole house was in a state of alarm and commotion. Natasha was very ill having, as Maria Dmitrievna told him, in secret, 
poison herself the night after she had been told that Anatole was married, with some arsenic she had stealthily procured. After swallowing a little, she had been so frightened that she woke Sonia and told her what she had done. The necessary antidotes had been administered in time, and she was now out of danger, though still so weak that it was out of the question to move her to the country, and so the countess had been sent for. Pierre saw the distracted Count and Sonia, who had a tear-stained face, but he could not see Natasha. Pierre dined at the club that day, and heard on all sides gossip about the attempted abduction of Rostova. He resolutely denied these rumors, assuring everyone that nothing had happened except that his brother-in-law had proposed to her and been refused. It seemed to Pierre that it was his duty to conceal the whole affair and re-establish Natasha's reputation. He was awaiting Prince Andrew's return with dread, and went every day to the old prince's for news of him. Old Prince Bolkonsky heard all the rumors current in the town from Mademoiselle Bourienne, and had read the note to Princess Mary in which Natasha had broken off her engagement. He seemed in better spirits than usual, and awaited his son with great impatience. Some days after Anatole's departure, Pierre received a note from Prince Andrew, informing him of his arrival and asking him to come to see him. As soon as he reached Moscow, Prince Andrew had received from his father Natasha's note to Princess Mary, breaking off her engagement. Mademoiselle Bourienne had purloined it from Princess Mary and given it to the old prince, and he heard from him the story of Natasha's elopement with additions. Prince Andrew had arrived in the evening, and Pierre came to see him next morning. Pierre expected to find Prince Andrew in almost the same state as Natasha, and was therefore surprised on entering the drawing-room to hear him in the study talking in a loud animated voice about some intrigue going on in Petersburg. The old prince's voice and another now and then interrupted him. Princess Mary came out to meet Pierre. She sighed, looking toward the door of the room where Prince Andrew was, evidently intending to express her sympathy with his sorrow, but Pierre saw by her face that she was glad both at what had happened and at the way her brother had taken the news of Natasha's faithlessness. "'He says he expected it,' she remarked. "'I know his pride will not let him express his feelings, but still he has taken it better, far better than I expected. Evidently it had to be.' "'But is it possible that all is really ended?' asked Pierre. Princess Mary looked at him with astonishment. She did not understand how he could ask such a question. Pierre went into the study. Prince Andrew, greatly changed and plainly in better health, but with a fresh horizontal wrinkle between his brows, stood in civilian dress facing his father and Prince Mercherski, warmly disputing and vigorously gesticulating. The conversation was about Speransky the news of whose sudden exile and alleged treachery had just reached Moscow. "'Now he is censured and accused by all who were enthusiastic about him a month ago,' Prince Andrew was saying, "'and by those who were unable to understand his aims. To judge a man who is in disfavor and to throw on him all the blame of other men's mistakes is very easy, but I maintain that if anything good has been accomplished in this reign it was done by him, by him alone.' He paused at the sight of Pierre. His face quivered and immediately assumed a vindictive expression. "'Posterity will do him justice,' he concluded, and at once turned to Pierre. "'Well, how are you? Still getting stouter?' he said with animation, but the new wrinkle on his forehead deepened. "'Yes, I am well,' he said in answer to Pierre's question, and smiled. To Pierre that smile said plainly, I am well, but my health is now of no use to anyone." After a few words to Pierre about the awful roads from the Polish frontier, about people he had met in Switzerland who knew Pierre, and about Monsieur de Salle, whom he had brought from abroad to be his son's tutor, Prince Andrew again joined warmly in the conversation about Speransky, which was still going on between the two old men. If there were treason or proofs of secret relations with Napoleon, they would have been made public," he said with warmth and haste. I do not and never did like Speransky personally, 
but I'd like justice." Pierre now recognized in his friend a need with which he was only too familiar, to get excited and to have arguments about extraneous matters in order to stifle thoughts that were too oppressive and too intimate. When Prince Merchersky had left, Prince Andrew took Pierre's arm and asked him into the room that had been assigned him. A bed had been made up there, and some open portmanteaus and trunks stood about. Prince Andrew went to one and took out a small casket, from which he drew a packet wrapped in paper. He did it all silently and very quickly. He stood up and coughed. His face was gloomy and his lips compressed. "'Forgive me for troubling you.' Pierre saw that Prince Andrew was going to speak of Natasha, and his broad face expressed pity and sympathy. This expression irritated Prince Andrew, and in a determined, ringing and unpleasant tone he continued, "'I have received a refusal from Countess Rostova, and have heard reports of your brother-in-law having sought her hand, or something of that kind. Is that true?' "'Both true and untrue,' Pierre began, but Prince Andrew interrupted him. "'Here are her letters and her portrait.' said he. He took the packet from the table and handed it to Pierre. "'Give this to the Countess, if you see her.' "'She is very ill,' said Pierre. "'Then she is here still?' said Prince Andrew. "'And Prince Karagin?' he added quickly. "'He left long ago. She has been at death's door.' "'I much regret her illness,' said Prince Andrew and he smiled like his father, coldly, maliciously, and unpleasantly. "'So, Monsieur Karagin has not honoured Countess Rostova with his hand?' said Prince Andrew, and he snorted several times. "'He could not marry, for he was married already,' said Pierre. Prince Andrew laughed disagreeably, again reminding one of his father. "'And where is your brother-in-law now, if I may ask?' he said. "'He has gone to Peter's, but I don't know,' said Pierre. "'Well, it doesn't matter,' said Prince Andrew. "'Tell Countess Rostova that she was and is perfectly free, and that I wish her all that is good.' Pierre took the packet. Prince Andrew, as if trying to remember whether he had something more to say, or waiting to see if Pierre would say anything, looked fixedly at him. "'I say, do you remember our discussion in Petersburg?' asked Pierre. "'About—' "'Yes,' returned Prince Andrew hastily. "'I said that a fallen woman should be forgiven. But I didn't say I could forgive her. I can't.' "'But can this be compared?' said Pierre. Prince Andrew interrupted him and cried sharply, "'Yes, ask her hand again. Be magnanimous and so on.' Yes, that would be very noble, but I am unable to follow in that gentleman's footsteps. If you wish to be my friend, never speak to me of that, of all that. Well, good-bye. So you'll give her the packet?" Pierre left the room and went to the old prince and Princess Mary. The old man seemed livelier than usual. Princess Mary was the same as always, but beneath her sympathy for her brother, Pierre noticed her satisfaction that the engagement had been broken off. Looking at them, Pierre realized what contempt and animosity they all felt for the Rostovs, and that it was impossible in their presence even to mention the name of her who could give up Prince Andrew for anyone else. At dinner the talk turned on the war, the approach of which was becoming evident. Prince Andrew talked incessantly, arguing now with his father, now with the Swiss tutor de Salle, and showing an unnatural animation, the cause of which Pierre so well understood. End of Book Eight, Chapter Twenty One. Book Eight, Chapter Twenty Two, of War and Peace, Volume Two, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Eight, Chapter Twenty Two. That same evening, Pierre went to the Rostovs to fulfill the commission entrusted to him. Natasha was in bed, 
the Count at the club, and Pierre, after giving the letters to Sonia, went to Maria Dmitrievna, who was interested to know how Prince Andrew had taken the news. Ten minutes later, Sonia came to Maria Dmitrievna. "'Natasha insists on seeing Count Peter Kirillovich,' said she. "'But how? Are we to take him up to her? The room there has not been tidied up.' "'No, she has dressed and gone into the drawing-room,' said Sonia. Maria Dmitrievna only shrugged her shoulders. "'When will her mother come? She has worried me to death. Now mind, don't tell her everything,' said she to Pierre. "'One hasn't the heart to scold her. She is so much to be pitied, so much to be pitied.' Natasha was standing in the middle of the drawing-room, emaciated, with a pale set face but not at all shamefaced as Pierre expected to find her. When he appeared at the door, she grew flurried, evidently undecided whether to go to meet him or to wait till he came up. Pierre hastened to her. He thought she would give him her hand as usual, but she, stepping up to him, stopped, breathing heavily, her arms hanging lifelessly just in the pose she used to stand in when she went to the middle of the ballroom to sing, but with quite a different expression of face. Peter Kirillovich, she began rapidly. Prince Bolkonsky was your friend, is your friend, she corrected herself. It seemed to her that everything that had once been must now be different. He told me once to apply to you. Pierre sniffed as he looked at her, but did not speak. Till then he had reproached her in his heart and tried to despise her, but he now felt so sorry for her that there was no room in his soul for reproach. He is here now. Tell him. To for... forgive me." She stopped and breathed still more quickly, but did not shed tears. "'Yes, I will tell him,' answered Pierre. "'But—' He did not know what to say. Natasha was evidently dismayed at the thought of what he might think she had meant. "'No, I know all is over,' she said hurriedly. No, that can never be. I'm only tormented by the wrong I have done him. Tell him only that I beg him to forgive, forgive, forgive me for everything." She trembled all over and sat down on a chair. A sense of pity he had never before known overflowed Pierre's heart. "'I will tell him. I will tell him everything once more,' said Pierre. "'But I should like to know one thing.' "'Know what?' Natasha's eyes asked. "'I should like to know, did you love—' Pierre did not know how to refer to Anatole and flushed at the thought of him. "'Did you love that bad man?' "'Don't call him bad,' said Natasha. "'But I don't know, don't know at all.' She began to cry, and a still greater sense of pity, tenderness, and love welled up in Pierre. He felt the tears trickle under his spectacles and hoped they would not be noticed. "'We won't speak of it any more, my dear,' said Pierre, and his gentle, cordial tone suddenly seemed very strange to Natasha. "'We won't speak of it, my dear. I'll tell him everything. But one thing I beg of you. Consider me your friend, and if you want help, advice, or simply to open your heart to someone—not now, but when your mind is clearer—' Think of me." He took her hand and kissed it. "'I shall be happy if it's in my power.' Pierre grew confused. "'Don't speak to me like that. I am not worth it!' exclaimed Natasha, and turned to leave the room, but Pierre held her hand. He knew he had something more to say to her, but when he said it he was amazed at his own words. "'Stop, stop! You have your whole life before you,' said he to her. Before me? No, all is over for me," she replied with shame and self-abasement. All over? he repeated. If I were not myself, but the handsomest, cleverest, and best man in the world, and were free, I would this moment ask on my knees for your hand and your love. For the first time for many days Natasha wept tears of gratitude and tenderness, and glancing at Pierre, she went out of the room. Pierre, too, when she had gone, almost ran into the anteroom, 
restraining tears of tenderness and joy that choked him, and without finding the sleeves of his fur cloak threw it on and got into his sleigh. "'Where to now, Your Excellency?' asked the coachman. "'Where to?' Pierre asked himself. "'Where can I go now? Surely not to the club or to pay calls.' All men seem so pitiful, so poor in comparison with this feeling of tenderness and love he experienced, in comparison with that softened, grateful, last look she had given him through her tears. "'Home,' said Pierre, and despite twenty-two degrees of frost Fahrenheit he threw open the bearskin cloak from his broad chest and inhaled the air with joy. It was clear and frosty. Above the dirty, ill-lit streets, Above the black roofs stretched the dark, starry sky. Only looking up at the sky did Pierre cease to feel how sordid and humiliating were all mundane things compared with the heights to which his soul had just been raised. At the entrance to the Arbat Square an immense expanse of dark, starry sky presented itself to his eyes. Almost in the center of it, above the Prechestenka Boulevard, surrounded and sprinkled on all sides by stars, but distinguished from them all by its nearness to the earth, its white light, and its long uplifted tail, shone the enormous and brilliant comet of 1812, the comet which was said to portend all kinds of woes and the end of the world. In Pierre, however, that comet with its long luminous tail aroused no feeling of fear. On the contrary, he gazed joyfully, his eyes moist with tears, at this bright comet, which, having travelled in its orbit with inconceivable velocity through immeasurable space, seemed suddenly, like an arrow piercing the earth, to remain fixed in a chosen spot, vigorously holding its tail erect, shining and displaying its white light amid countless other scintillating stars. It seemed to Pierre that this comet fully responded to what was passing in his own softened and uplifted soul, now blossoming into a new life. End of Book 8, Chapter 22 End of War and Peace, Volume 2, by Leo Tolstoy Translated by Elmer Maud.